Oh, not much. Just getting chopped, getting chopped around today. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I know. What is up, dude? It's a Monday, you know? Monday. I mean, and everybody's getting chopped up. Yeah, it's just, I think some earnings coming up soon. So um, they just love bullet chop, Suey. Exactly. I think we yep. got some earnings coming up that we might just be consolidating. We're building some pressure. So, but we might be waiting on that to go bullish or bearish. I'm not really sure, but I'd have to lean, uh, lean a little bit more bullish on SPY right now for the end of the day is kind of what I'm leaning at. So we'll see. Roger. All right, buddy. I'm going to turn them over to you. Uh, everybody, like I said, man, if you ever wanted to learn about options, you are in the right place at the right time. So have some great time with Tony and I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Aloha. Aloha, brother. Hey, man, see you. What's happening? Um, I'm going to kick my camera. I usually don't have my camera on, but what's going on? I figured I'd at least interact a little bit with all of y'all. Hope you're doing well. Um, let me get my screen share started. And let's dive into these options, shall we? If uh, if you're brand new to options, what's up, man? Um, Adam, what's going on? If you're brand new to options, ask away. This is a perfect time to learn them. So, hey, what's going on? Man, so, Andy, what's going on? Welcoming, man. I appreciate it. Maddie, what's up? Hey. Um, Brandon wants to learn options. Brand new to options also. Sweet. Type in a one if you are brand spanking new to options. Type in a two if you're like, I know options. Okay. We're getting a lot of mixed. Cool. Sweet. Love options. Yeah, me too. Options are awesome. Um, so normally I would like, you know, I just go over these markets. There's really not a whole lot going on right now. To be honest, um, it does kind of look, I'm sorry, there's a lot of little lines here, but this breakout is what I've been waiting on all stinking day. And it should continue to push up more bullish. We'll see if that actually happens. But um, yeah, that's kind of where we've been at. So let's see here. We've got um, tried to go bullish over through here and then exited. We went some bearishness and kind of got out of my bear trades through here because it's just kind of stumbled. And then it finally rolled over. And then just been kind of hanging out. So again, just a whole lot of nothing going on. Stafford, what's going on? Since I watched a video on Tesla collar trade, first time seeing that strategy, you could position your trades so you can't lose. I use those trades a lot. Yeah. Yep. Use those trades a lot. So um, callers are really cool, right? You're just, you're, you're agreeing to sell your shares to someone. By the way, this should bounce right here. We'll see if it does. If this comes crashing through, then man, it just it's just an absolute nothing sauce. This is where you would expect the bulls to be at, right there. Let's see if they step in. Um, they're trying to. So far, just chopping around. If it breaks this line, it should fall through pretty hard. Should hold it though. Um 15 just man it's just been like this all day just will not pick a direction not worth trading man it's been lame but yeah callers are awesome i use those all the time if ever i'm in positions especially over earnings i, I sell a lot of those things over earnings and okay that's an interesting candle there's not a whole lot of buying coming off of the top side of this trend line Will we take this out? Are we going to see any buyers come through? Taking it out so far. Is it a trap? Is it not? Here's the 200, this red line. Could we be buying off of that? But it's just so dang flat, man. I mean, we did end up hitting one of the targets up here. So bulls possibly exited. Um, but totally add that strategy. It's one of the best strategies you can do. Yeah. Um, 
so I'll walk you through, I'll take a little break here from teaching. So I'm going to do uh, spend some time right now. We have about an hour. I'll spend some time teaching you some options. Feel free to ask questions. And then we'll take a quick little break in the meantime and just like check on the charts, right? This is where your bulls should be. So will they actually come in? It's a good freaking question, right? I've been waiting on the bulls to come in all day. Really nice retest. We bought calls down through here. It bounced up and then we exited those calls once we broke that trend, grabbed some puts and then just kind of meh on everything today. <laughs> it just won't go, but it's trying to. Um, let's see here. Spy is trying to get going on that. Four, five, seven right now is, is a struggle bus. We've got about 55 minutes left in the day. And let's see here. <clears throat> I'm just to time this thing up if I feel like going long here. This is about where it should be at. I think I'll just wait for this candle to close. Two minutes, 45 seconds. I'll put an alert in case it starts to run up. But this is where I bet it's probably going to try to go more bullish if it's going to. And I just don't know if it will. All right, let's talk some options. So um, you have two different types, okay? You have call options. Easiest way to think about this, this makes money when the stock goes up. Okay, this is very bland, right? <laughs> so it's not always, we could sell off, but we're just talking about right now, we're just talking about buying options, okay? So we're buying options. We've got a call make money as the price goes up. We've got puts that increase in value as the stock goes lower. Okay. We're just trying to keep it as simple as we can. Okay. This is again, buying options. Okay. So those are your two right here. Call. It's like buying the stock puts. It's like shorting the stock. Simple way to think about it. Okay. Um, so let's dive in real quick here to the calls. So talking about calls, one of the easiest ways to think about call options, let's see if this is going to go. One of the simplest ways to think about call options is it's like earnest money down on a house. Okay. So I'm thinking about pulling the trigger here on a few calls, actually. Just trying to see how this candle is going to want to close. Oh, man. It's just such a dumb little day today. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's like buying, it's like putting earnest money on a house. Okay. So you've got a house over here. I'm going to draft some awesome, amazing. Look at that house. Dang. Even a little front. What's up. All right. So we've got ourselves a house here across the street. There is an open field. And some of you have heard this kind of it's pretty popular, but, um, so this house is worth $300,000. You walk up and you go, Hey, I will give you $5,000 earnest money to enter into a contract with me to buy this house. Okay. So for $5,000, you now control a $300,000 asset, right? So for the duration that you have, let's say you have two months to buy this house and you put $5,000 down. Okay. At any point you could back out, you just lose your five grand or you could go through and purchase the house. While you're under contract across the street, they are going to develop this lot. So they're either going to make this an awesome park. There's a slide. Man, that's a great slide. That's a pretty good slide, actually. Um, they could either do a park or they could do just a nasty waste facility that's just disgusting. Bulls did not buy this thing up, by the way. So it should start to fall. Um, interesting. So... Let it do it. Okay. Um, if you're under contract with this and they decide to build this waste transfer facility across the street, the house is now worth 250K, let's just say. Okay. So you could go through with a purchase, but you're going to be underwater $50,000, or you could just walk away from your $5,000. One of the two. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the downside of that. What if they decide to build this park? Awesome. Well, now your house is worth $350,000 that you're under contract to buy it for 300. That doesn't change. So if you've got a contract to buy this house for 300,000 
and it's now worth 350. You've got 50 grand of instant equity. You could now turn to someone else and go, hey, pay me 15 grand and you can have instant equity in this house. I own a property that, you know, I own a contract that allows me to buy it for 300,000. It's worth 350. Are we following along? So it's valuable to someone to pay 15 grand for that because they're getting instant equity. Right? They're still ahead in the game. They could turn around and sell this house and still make profit on it. Whereas for you, you spent five grand and now you're, you just made 15,000 bucks. Cool. You never even had to own the house. How does this apply to options? Okay. Um, light bulbs. Let's go. It's already starting to click. If you wanted to buy this stock, Okay, and let's say right here on SPY, you buy the 457 strike call. Okay, that's a terrible side blade at the horizontal line, but you get it. The 457, the stock is not at 457, right? But there is a, a possibility that if you buy this, let's say you bought this for a dollar, okay? If it does, while you own this, if this thing goes up to like 458, that's a dollar worth of equity right there. So you could then turn around and sell this to someone for two bucks. And they're going to go, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll spend $2 on this because I instantly have equity in this thing, right? So that's kind of how you're, that's how I'm trading options. I'm not necessarily buying it to own it. I don't care to actually own SPY at 457, but I'm buying a, a call option that gives me the opportunity to buy spy at 457 if i want to but ideally what i want to do is have it be you know have the stock a lot higher than that so that i can turn around and flip it to someone else for more earnest money than what i paid for that contract to purchase it because why would they want to spend two dollars on it well if spy is at 460 or 459 and they get a contract that allows them to buy it at 457 that's valuable right there's value to that by the way spy is just not bouncing at all back to the support struggle busting. So what happens if I were to buy the 457 and SPY does this and just tanks? Well, I'm going to have to sell this for a cheaper, you know, either I just lose the premium that I spent on it. So if I spent a dollar on this, that dollar's gone, or I could try to sell it to someone else for let's say 50 cents. Okay. Um, that's how you're making money with options. Simple as that. You are trying to use price action to tell you that there is a chance that the stock could be worth more than what it is now when it comes to calls. And so before it gets there, um, before it gets there, then you're buying it like right now. Like if I were to buy some calls right now up here and you can choose whatever strike you want, like you could buy the 458, you could buy the... Shoot, you could buy the 455 already in the money, right? If you really wanted to. Um, but it's up to you. And we'll go over why you'd want to buy at the money or in the money. We can kind of cover that if you want. Um, Brenda says, do you have a choice of what to sell? Do you have a choice of what to sell your loser for? Whatever it's worth, okay? Um, yeah, it, it's whatever the markets are willing to pay for it. All right. So if we, in order to kind of answer that better, we have to talk a little bit about um, intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Okay. There's two, there's, there's two basics that make up the price of an option. All right. Um, we've got intrinsic value. We've got extrinsic value. Intrinsic is what it's actually worth. Okay. So if I right here bought the 457 strike calls right there, right now, if I turn and sell it to someone, what is it actually worth? Well, it's actually worth zero right now. Absolutely nothing. Because why would someone buy something that a contract that lets them buy spy at 457 if they can just go to the market right now and buy it for 456 58 right so it's worthless the only way this call is actually worth something is if it's above my strike then it's got intrinsic value to it does that make sense so if spy is up to you know 458 then it's got a dollar of intrinsic value 
right? There, there's actual dollar value to that because you can buy this at 457 and the stock's currently at 458. Make sense? There's intrinsic value. If it's below it for calls, there is no value to it. There is, it's worth nothing. No one is going to go out there and pay me money to buy buy at a higher price than they could just go to the market and buy it at, right? Like I could list my house for sale for $100 million. If this house is worth 1 million, no one's going to buy it for 100 million. It's just, I can list it for whatever I want, but no one's going to buy it from me, right? Um, so that's kind of intrinsic value. It's the actual value of what that option's worth. So then why is it right now, if I go to my broker and I look at the 457, it costs 16 cents. Why is there actual, why does it cost anything if it's technically worth zero? Because extrinsic value. Let's dive into that. Extrinsic value is simply hope. It's hope that yes, buy is not above 457 right now, but there's a chance that it can by expiration. And this is for today's expiration, by the way, 16 cents. Okay. So there is a hope factor to it. There's value to that, that there is a possibility that this could be in the money, even though it's not. So that, that has value. It's just a lot lower value than intrinsic, right? Intrinsic is actual value. Extrinsic is just hope, okay? So this is what happens to a lot of people. They go, all right, SPY looks like it's going to bounce. I'm just using this for an example. SPY looks like it's going to bounce. And I am going to buy the 458 strike calls. Why? Because they only cost five cents right now. Um, actually, they're three cents. <laughs> they're cheap. Remember, with an option, each contract's for 100 shares. So you got to times this by 100. Okay. So times that by 100, you get it. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so um, they're worth three cents. And you're like, wow, that's so cheap. And then the stock does this, it bounces. And you're like, oh my gosh, yes, I'm making so much money. And then it does this. And then what happens to all your money? It goes away. So for easier, just to make this more sense, let's say these cost 10 cents, okay? And the stock bounces all the way up to here. And then it does this. Why is this going to be worth two cents? Because remember, you bought this on hope. And the hope is that by expiration, so within 40 minutes, stock will be above 458. Well, Johnny talked about the average true range, right? Stock can only move so much. Is it possible for SPY to go to 458 in the next 40 minutes? It's possible. How likely is it? It's not very likely. In fact, there is about a 5% chance that it would do that. So in order for it to do this, this thing has to perfectly go there. So if any, at any time this thing starts to pull back, <clears throat> then there, the odds of it getting up to 458 are getting crushed. And your, your entire out of the money, it's all extrinsic value. So it's all hope. And the hope gets dashed very, very, very fast unless it works perfect. So a lot of people are like, I was correct on the movement and I still didn't make any money. Correct. Because you bought hope. And if it doesn't get up above your strike by the end of the day, there is no value to that option. It's worth nothing. So at the end of the day, that's exactly what it'll be worth. Whether you paid 50 cents for it, whether you paid 10 cents for it, whether whatever, paid $20 for it. If it doesn't finish in the money, it's worth nothing. Make sense? So if you're looking at probabilities wise, the markets are telling us where they expect it to go. Um, four, five, six down here, the markets are saying there's a very low chance, about a 5% chance that we'll get and close below four, five, six today. On the upside, the markets are saying um, four, five, eight, four, five, eight. There is a 5% chance it's going to get there. So this is kind of our range for the day. It's a little bit more skewed to the bull side right now, but um, that's that's what the options are telling us, okay? Stafford, whenever I'm buying them, I usually look at like a 40 or a 35 delta. That's where you want to be. So just barely out of the money. Okay. 
<clears throat> so this is what happens to a lot of people over earnings. Okay, so the last little part that I want to talk about is implied volatility. Right before earnings, and we're like, oh my gosh, Tesla is going to have amazing earnings. It's going to be great. It's going to go to all time. It's going to be amazing. So we go on to Tesla here. I'll do Tesla so it's actually easier. Um, so we go out to Tesla here. And we go, oh yeah, it's definitely going higher up to 300 or something, right? Tesla's already had earnings, by the way. It wasn't great. Um, wasn't bad. Wasn't great. I think, I think we're going to go to 300. So what do they do? They buy the 300 strike calls. <clears throat> if we are right before earnings, they are expecting a large move before earnings. Okay, it's priced in. The larger the expected move, the higher the price of the options. The lower the expected move, the cheaper the options, okay? So <clears throat> I like to talk about this, like if you were at a baseball game, outside on the street, outside the stadium, there's a little vendor that has, you know, hot dogs. That's a great hot dog stand. They're selling that hot dog for two bucks. That's what the value of that hot dog actually is. You go inside the ballpark and that same exact hot dog is $8. Same exact hot dog, eight bucks. Why? Because you're not gonna leave the stadium to go buy a $2 hot dog so they can jack the price up, right? So if anyone's trying to buy calls or puts right before, um, right before earnings, it's like them going into the ballpark and buying 20 hot dogs for $8 and then going on the street and trying to sell them for 16 bucks. Good luck, right? Hot dogs worth $2. So right before earnings, these calls, for the same analogy, these calls right now cost eight bucks. They normally cost $2. Why is it so expensive? Because they're expecting a huge move before earnings. And so earnings comes and you get a big gap up to 290. Well, let's just look at this. If these options... If these options originally cost $2 and they gapped up, they're probably costing about $4 now. That's normally what it would cost. So remember, you spent $8 on these calls and then it gapped up to here. Well, earnings is done now, so volatility is going down. So now these options return back to normal, so they're worth four bucks. So you just lost half your money. Right? You were correct. It made a huge move up. But the problem is you paid two or three times more than what you need to. So in order for you to make money, Tesla needs to gap a huge distance so that these $2 normally would be worth like $10 up there. And so if you paid $8 here and Tesla gets the huge gap, you'll be up two bucks. That makes sense? So you have intrinsic value, extrinsic value, and implied volatility are some of the main driving factors to the pricing of options. Cool. What is the indicator with the red bar? This guy right here. This is, it, it acts kind of like a Bollinger Band, but it's just kind of giving you the range of where it should stay in. It's called the Nadira Watson envelope, one at 310. Oh, up here. Um, it just marks out some key levels. So it's just finds resistances. I don't know what it's even called, but the MSB OB90. <laughs> um, great questions. How do, you, how do you calculate where your R with options? Um, Wow, these bulls suck today. I mean, there's just no one there. It went right up to that little resistance and just getting hammered now. This could fall off really hard. Um, all right, so how do you calculate your risk with that? Um, there's a few ways, okay? You can do the simplest way, and this is what I recommend for anyone starting out. Whatever you pay for that option is the most you can lose. If you spent $100 on calls, the worst thing that can happen is you lose 100 bucks. You can't lose 1000 or anything like that. That's only for buying, okay? So if you're spending $100 buying calls or you're spending $100 buying puts, that's the worst thing that can happen. Whatever you pay for it when you're buying, that is worst case scenario. So let's say you have an R of $100. Well, if you bought $100 worth of calls, the worst thing that can happen is you lose an R. So that's one way to, um, 
that's one way to calculate your R on this thing is just use absolute zeros is what they're called. Okay. <clears throat> wow, very strong. Very, very strong. Real quick, let's take a break and look at where are these markets trying to go for the day? Well, the bulls have just been absolutely getting shredded this entire time. If we go to the big picture, right? We're just an inside candle of last week. So there's really nothing going on. Um, Maddie, if you sell options, then it's possible. But if you buy options, then no. Um, but your broker most of the time won't let you get leveraged too far beyond what you already have for margin. Okay. Um, so again, this week is just a whole lot of nothing sauce. We are sitting right on top of a previous week there. Let me get these alerts out of the way. So this little guy right here is what we're, what we're hitting at the moment. Um, this is extremely overbought my friends. I mean, this is way, way, way up there. Can it continue? Yes, it can. Um, will it continue? No idea. So I think we could still probably get up to this wick 462 area as possible, but not really showing a whole lot of strength. So then we go back to a daily chart here and all we're really doing is just kind of chopping through here. This is telling me we're starting to lose some strength. I mean, that one bear candle that took up and engulfed the entire week then um yeah nick i'm not sure slack is included for free week no i could be wrong but i don't think it is um <clears throat> so yeah we've gotten a, we got a candle engulfing the entire week and we're just still stuck inside of that so really until we start getting up above the higher below the low of that candle we're not going to get any real significant um any significant move. Jay, I agree with you on this. This is way stronger than I expected it to be. I thought we would have a bear candle and probably not even retest, gap down and go. Whenever you get a candle that strong, it usually just gaps down, right? And if we did retest, which is fine, we should have hit this and had a lot more sellers on Friday. And then a gap up today is even more of like, man, where are the sellers, right? Um, it's just, they're not there. Is just nowhere to be found. So um, you got a lot of people taking profits. There's no doubt. Everyone is convinced this is the place to buy and it probably does go up higher. I, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that this is not the place to buy. This is the place to take profits, right? Your big money, if you want to trade successfully, you've got to trade where the big money's trading. <clears throat> the big money is not loading in bullish up here. Now they might have some short-term plays. They might play it bullish up above that, but they're not loading in like they loaded in down here. Okay. They're just not. So um, by the way, SPY has about 80 trillion gaps left behind. SPY never leaves gaps. And it's this year, I, I don't think it's filled like any gaps this year. <laughs> now that's not true, but that's what it feels like. I mean, the fact that we left like three or four gaps right here alone is insane. And then we had another one there and another one there and another one there and another one there and another one there. Did we fill that one actually? No, we did. We did fill that one and another one there. And I think that's it. <clears throat> There's probably more that I'm missing. Um, Spy loves to fill its gaps. Has it left gaps open before? Yes. But it usually will fill them. So it's just a matter of time. It might take <clears throat> it might take years, but SPY, the ETFs, for some reason, they tend to fill more gaps than other you've opened. Other stocks, maybe not so much. Um, will I be explaining the trading plan? Um, what trading plan are you looking at? What are you looking for? I'm just now. Oh. Yeah, let me know. <clears throat> let me know what you're looking at.
Yeah, Wes, maybe that's what that is. Yeah, let me know. It's always hard to talk through chat. So, <laughs> um, hold on one second. I'm just helping someone out on Slack real quick too. <clears throat> Um, Wes, you, you, or I'm sorry. Um, let's see who's, who mentioned, I thought I saw something. Got to wait for all the newbies to hop on the bull train. Then it drops like a stone. That's kind of what I've been waiting on. It's just been like three months of waiting more, but. <clears throat> oh, Tom, that's what I was looking at. Put ratio backspreads. Yeah. I think now's a good, I mean, I've been kind of buying puts on spy up here. And I've legged out of some puts when we didn't roll over pretty hard on Friday because I was in heavy. So now I'm just in my normal size. Um, it's just not really acting the way a stock, a bearish stock should. So honestly, until we get below 455 or until we get above 458, I just don't think it's going to have much momentum to do anything. Can we make big moves? Yeah, we made a big move there. We made a big move here. Like it can move, but I don't think it's going to be a consistent follow through. Move down, go up. Move up, go down, right? It's just a lot more chop, more than an actual trend. But this is a pretty good, pretty good little trap here. Um, will it actually go lower? Man, I don't know. I just don't know if it's going to do a whole lot today. It hasn't done a whole lot today anyways so let me get rid of some of these lines here <clears throat> All right. um nancy says do you have any strategies on trading options six to nine months in advance yeah um Again, it just depends on what you want to do. So if you're going to be buying options, you need to be buying them. This is just a safety rule. You don't have to do this, but starting out, it'll keep you safe. If you're looking at like six months out, you need to buy your options at least two times longer than that. It's so like a year out, okay? So you need to be buying them 12 months out if you think it's going to take six months. If you think the move's going to happen in two weeks, you need to be buying it four weeks out. So give yourself more time than you think. If you give yourself the exact time that you need, so if you think this move will happen in two weeks and you buy it two weeks out and then it does this, you're going to get crushed. Bill, because remember what we talked about on the expected move, right? If you buy calls, just going back to the same example, if you bought the 458 strike calls, if it goes higher, but it runs out of time, even though you're correct, you don't make any money. It's worthless. You want your option to be deep in the money by the time it gets to expiration. And by the way, I don't hold till expiration unless I really do, you know, 99% of my trades, I'm not holding till expiration. <clears throat> so, yeah. So give yourself plenty of time. So options itself is not a strategy. Like that's what people get struggled with as well. Options is a tool to make money. Now, there are different ways you can apply those tools. Um, so you can, you know, you can do credit spreads, you can do debit spreads, you can do long options, you can do naked puts, right? All of those are ways that you can apply. But really what it comes down to is you've got to diagnose the markets. Are we going up or are we going down? Because without that, it doesn't matter what you do. Same, Chris, I love, love, love credit spreads. I wish we had a little bit more volatility this year, make credit spreads a little bit easier, but I love credit spreads. <clears throat> um, so for example, on, on, uh, credit spread. So on Wells Fargo, when Wells Fargo was screaming up here, let me turn this on. When Wells Fargo was screaming up here, we sold a bear call spread up here, 50 bucks. Why did we do that? Why? Because I understood charts. Does it mean that it can't go higher? No, totally can. That's why I have a game plan of what to do to offset my risk in case this goes up. But remember what we talked about. Someone bought the 50 strike calls, okay? 
Um, wow, SPY really starting to move lower now. Breaking down this little guy here. Coming back. This 200 has been the bouncing spot all day. So let's see if it ends up being the bounce spot again. Um, so when this thing was screaming up, I don't know what, back July 20th, when I think I got into this thing on like the 19th, I'm pretty sure though. Um, when this thing was screaming up, I sold that bear call spread. Why? Because I believe that Wells Fargo is going to have some sort of chop or pullback before it goes higher, if it's going to go higher. So on this pullback, what's going to happen to their option? Well, if, <clears throat> right, if it pulls back, it's, it's too far out of the money with not enough time, it's going to lose value. Yeah. So for me, I sold that call. So I make money when that person loses money is the easiest way to think about it. Okay. Um, so whoever bought those 50 strike calls are getting crushed and they're running out of time now. And so it should be able to pull back a little bit more or just go sideways and he's going to lose his whole value, even though technically it's pretty much at the location that he bought his calls at because theta has taken money off, right? And then your delta is changing. You have all these things going on that if you buy after all of this move up and you buy way out of the money, you're going to really struggle to make money. <clears throat> That's why I love selling options. Selling options is one of the best ways to make money because it's, it's a consistent way of making money. The problem is it's just trying to get, everything is exactly the same right now. It's just all vertical, which makes it really hard to sell because everything looks, I don't want to be in five stocks that all look exactly the same, right? So if Wells Fargo can keep pulling down, then cool, I'll win on this trade um, pretty easily. If we go sideways for another week, I'll win on this trade. If we start rampaging higher, I've got a game plan of how I can offset my loss for my spread. Don't sell credit spreads unless you know how to offset their loss. That's my rules. That's my plan. I'll show you how you know, my plan works. Um, Tom, what's going on? There's not a whole lot going on either way. Yeah. Do I have an options trading paid subscription? Um, I at real life trading, if you get the all access pass, you get access to options trades, and me and a few other options traders go on the mic throughout the week and we'll walk you through that stuff. Um, there are some other options as well. Uh, if you're interested in so I kind of have a, a private group that I, I teach to, you're welcome to do stuff like that. Um, but really it's, it's, that's kind of the, the option that you can get into. So just being an all access pass member is going to help you out. You can get access to that in our options trades. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks for being here. Please let us know if you have any of the questions. Happy to help out. Spy, not bouncing. Really good cons consolidation and then just breaking down hard. Um. slowly but surely going lower i think there's a chance that this could start to bounce but this will up your options game <laughs> yeah that's the plan but i mean a big part of it though a big part of being successful in anything in trading is to be patient right i think people sign up like hey if i'm not pressing buttons every day i'm quitting right or if i to be successful in trading, it's more of a waiting game and it's more of planning and and just waiting for your opportunity, waiting for your setups, and then it's, it's pressing the button then, right? It's not this like, I get in and out 45,000 times in a second. Now, there are, there are scalpers and there are people that do that for sure. But for 98% of the people actually, you know, trading these markets, you'll find something common amongst all the professional traders is they stay out of the game until it's time to go. Right. So most people go when it's not time to be in the game and then they get really upset and they go, Oh, I've lost all this money. And then I'm just going to take two days off. And that day is when the markets move. Right. They're just playing their emotions. Most people just trade their emotions. When they're down on the day, the only thing they want to do is just make their money back. Why? 
because losing money is painful. And if your brain can undo that pain, then you'll be happy. That's not a successful trader, right? Derek, I mainly, I would say 95% day trade SPY because of options. SPY is the most liquid out there for options and it's expirations every day. If you're going to day trade, SPY is the one to day trade. So what's up, man? So you got PLTR captured 80% today. Nice. My rules would say 70 or above, cut it. Take your profits on, a, I don't know if that's a credit spread or what, but. Yeah, I just need to reread it. Maybe you mentioned it too, but sorry, I'm getting chats. And by the way, if you don't have, if, if you're on host and panelists, only I can see them, which is totally fine. If you do everyone, then everyone can see them. So. Yeah, PLTR just going to the moon right before earnings. So that's kind of fun. Um, this is also a huge resistance. So be careful on this. Okay, there's a bull put spread, 14.13. Nice, way to go. Way to go. When are earnings on this? Oh, not till Monday, okay. Good stuff. Um, on SPY here, so this would be about the spot the bears would come in. It's too late in the day for me to trade these. You can trade them. It's just, if you're going to trade options, you need to go deeper in the money this late in the day if they expire today or just do tomorrow's expiration because you can make a lot of money, but if you're wrong, you'll it'll go to zero in two seconds. So... Ramius says, can you explain what a naked call and do you use them? Um, no, I do. I can explain it. I do not use naked calls. In my opinion, that's probably one of the, it, that is the most risky strategy and most brokers won't even let you do it. Um, to sell naked calls is what you're doing. Um, basically, you are trying to go short. So if you just sold a naked call, just simply sold a call. Well, if you are buying a call, you're agreeing to buy shares at $100, or sorry, 100 contracts a strike, right? Per contract, can't talk. If you're selling it, you're doing the opposite. You're agreeing to go short 100 shares. Well, the problem with that is if the stock rampages up, you know, you get a PLTR that just goes up 80% over the last two months, you're going to get crushed. So what most people do is they don't close it out because they're like, I'm down too much, it'll pull back and then it just keeps going and it wrecks you. And the thing is, stocks can go up as high as they want, right? So uh, you can get squeezed out of things pretty bad. So that's where you really want to be cautious on. Um, for me personally, I just wouldn't sell it. Do a bear call spread and set. So at least you're selling a call, but you're buying a call above it. So you have insurance. That way, if something goes crazy, at least you have a max loss. You're not going to blow up your entire account. So when we talk about your broker, you owing your broker more money than you have, 90% of the time, it's from people selling naked calls. Now, could that also happen with naked puts? Yes, it can happen with naked puts. But at least with puts, you're buying a stock and you're usually doing it a lot lower than where it's at. Stocks tend to be more bullish than bearish. So when you're selling a call, you're stepping out in front of it, which is kind of a dangerous thing to do. All right. Yep. So that's, that's all it really is. <laughs> All right, let's see if these markets want to cooperate. This is where the bear should be at, right here. I like these EMAs play. That was a strong, you had a trapping candle right there, came back down, close strong. This is where your bear should be at. Remember we talked about how the bulls should have bought right here or something, I don't remember where. Um, bulls should have bought that up and they didn't. Well, this is where your bear should be at. So they should start to push this thing back down eventually. Where to, I don't know. It's tough to say this late in the day.
So this move right here, bouncing back up, hit that. This is where your bear should be and push it back down. I would say the majority of people lose money in the markets, first off because of their emotions, second off because they don't know how to trade the markets, right? Most people would be looking to go long and bullish right here. I'm looking to go short. They've got no plan. Yeah, it, it's just, well, and another thing too is they think that the strategy is what's going to make them money. It's like, no, you've got to understand how to read price action. You've got to understand to go, all right, this is where I want to go short. What strategy over here in my toolbox can I use to make money to the downside? I could short this. I could buy puts. I could do a bear call spread. I could do a bear put spread. Like I could, you know, there's what strategy do you want? There's a thousand strategies out there. What strategy do you want to use to make money to the downside? Because if you can't look at a chart and go, this is what should be happening. Bear should be here. Bulls should have been there. And as soon as the bulls don't step in, well, look what happens. It falls really, really hard. Why? Because all the bulls that got in are getting stopped out. Great question, Bill. Um, so why was this the place to go short? Um, price action. So whenever a stock makes a move down, it's going to bounce up and it's going to rotation back lower. Okay. So we went down, we had to move back up. There's a high probability it's going to rotate back lower. Um, wow, SPY really, really crushing down here to try to finish out today. This is a very weak candle. It's still inside. I mean, we did break the high by a little bit, but we're closing inside the range still of Friday. It's nothing new, but a large gap down would definitely be changing a few things. Um, so this is a really, really solid place. So if we go to a smaller time frame, you'll see that, right? Move down, bounce up, move down again. So now this should probably continue down a little bit. And then guess what's going to happen? It's going to bounce back up. And when it bounces back up, your bear should be sitting right through here. So when it gets up to there, your bear should short that and push it back lower again if it wants to go lower. So that's once you understand how price action works, then you can start going, okay, well, we should be moving down, bounce back up, and then we should move back down again. If the bulls come in and bounce it back up, there's your double bottom. And now you know we're bullish and it's going to do the same thing except to the bull side. Okay. So that's why that should have been a short right there. <clears throat> um, X O M. Is this a buy? Um, I don't mind it, actually. Um, <clears throat> for me personally, I like stocks that are a little bit more trending instead of just range bound, but this thing is just very sideways. We are kind of doing this little descending flag type play. So I would need a strong close up above that trend line. Once I get that strong close up above this trend line on a daily, then that would let me know that the bulls are finally breaking out of this downward trend and it's most likely going to revert back up to like 114. Okay. Most likely. Will it actually do that? I have no idea, but that makes the most sense to me. So for me personally, I would wait for that candle to close strong and then see if you get a pullback. A lot of the times you won't get pullbacks, but that's how I would do it. <clears throat> Uber puts for earnings. Um, you can. The only problem is, again, trying to buy options right before earnings is really tough because they they cost so much money. A normal put on this would cost a dollar, and the puts right now are costing three dollars. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what they actually cost, but that's going to be a lot like it. If you look at the volatility, it's it's going to be a lot higher than hot liar, a lot higher than normal. Um, so what I like to do is for me, playing earnings is a lot more gambling because it's, it's almost like just putting money on black and then just spinning it. Right. So what you need to do is watch the reaction. The charts will tell you what they're going to do. If we get a big gap down, that would be breaking trend lines. That would be breaking trends. Let it retest, then go short. 
if we gap up, let it retest, buy it here and go bullish, right? The stocks will tell you what they're trying to do. Does it mean it's going to work? No, um, but they'll tell you what they're trying to do. So it's really hard to be like, man, this is really extended into a great resistance and everything. And I think their earnings are going to be bad. They could be. But if they come out and go, hey, we project awesomeness for next quarter, then it gaps up. It doesn't matter how bad the earnings are, right? You've all seen that. Tesla is like, yeah, we did pretty good on our deliveries. Pfft, still gap down. Right? Because it's, it's a lot on the projection. So it really is, it's a tough game to play. It's not so much what did they do last quarter, it's what are they projected to do next quarter. <clears throat> Bill, totally you can. Yep. So if you look at your broker, you're going to see something called IV rank. And that's terrible. I don't have my pen, but IV rank. Your IV rank is going to tell you if it's high or low volatility. Okay. And every stock has a different IV rank. So for like Uber, it might be 20% or something. And if Uber is sitting at 40%, that's telling you that it's high. If the average is 20. Okay. <clears throat> and you can't just use that number because every stock is different. Tesla, the average volatility is like 40% or something. I don't know. Something like that's high. Um, whereas for SPY, it's like 24%. That's the average. Okay. One other way that you can use it is called IV percentile. Um, IV percentile will kind of give you that spectrum. So if it's at 1%, you know it's you know it's at the bottom side of things for the 52 weeks. If it's at 99%, you know it's at the top end of the 52 weeks. Does that make sense? So you could look at those things to help you to know if it's you know if it's in the mud or if it's high or cheap. Jack, puts versus buying SQQ. Could you please spend a few minutes on explaining pros and cons, including decay and leverage ETFs? Yeah, for sure. So the nice thing about just buying SQQQ is that it's shares. You, you don't have theta against you, right? Um, whereas if you're buying a put, every day that goes by, you're losing money. Whether it's working for you or not, you're losing money, okay? Um, the nice thing is with a put is that you can leverage your money way more than anything else, right? Puts are going to give you a massive return. Like you could do a thousand percent return with puts. SQQQ, you could do that, but it's it's going to be hard to get a thousand percent return, right? Because you're basically just buying the shares. Um, so it would have to be a massive move. In that case, the options the options are always going to be, you know, you'll make 50x more, but you also have a lot more going into it, right? You have you have theta working against you. It not only has to go in your direction, but it has to go all the way in your direction. If it spends six months doing this and then goes in your direction, you're not going to make any money with the puts. Whereas if you own the shares, the opposite, right? Then you'd be just fine. So there's pros and cons to everything. Check on SPY Rizzle and see what we got. SPY is still just hanging the top side of this trend line and it continues to bounce off of it. That is bullish. So let's see if we get a nice big gap up. Um, I do want to, let's take a nice, quick little gander here at, oh, come on. At who's reporting? I think the big dogs are Wednesday, right? Um, a lot of stocks reporting, but I think realistically, it's Starbucks, Pins. I think I did Tuesday. Sorry, I did Wednesday. Shop. When is Amazon's? That's a lot of freaking tickers on Wednesday. Holy crap. That's a that's a lot. Um I don't really trust trading view too much, but Thursday. Oh, it's Thursday. <clears throat> cool. Um, Amazon bouncing up. We're kind of into this nice little resistance area. Spy still trying to hang out tough. 
still following this trend line extremely well. Um, Thursday for Apple. I knew there was another big one. Yeah. So Thursday is going to be a big day. Jack, no matter what, um, there's strategies for sure, but it's more about it's more about controlling your risk, and it's more about just understanding how things move. Because again, I could give you a strategy, I could give you the world's greatest bear strategy or bull strategy, and if you do it in a bear market, you don't make any money. First things first, you got to learn how to read the markets, and it's easier said than done. And markets are always changing, right? But a lot of people are like, just buy a hammer every time you see um, a hammer on the SQs. And it's like, well, what about that? That one didn't work, right? There's a big difference between that hammer and, do we even have another one? And this one, right? It's more about understanding the price, more about understanding where to go long, where to go short. And then, yes, if I believe that we're going to get ready to bounce right here and I get a hammer in that area, then I can use that hammer to even signify even more. <clears throat> right. So, um, yeah, for me, I need that. the wick's got to be twice as long as the body. So close. I like, you know, that's a good hammer. That's a good hammer. I mean, again, so if you're just very like absolute, like every time I see a hammer, I buy, it means buy. It doesn't, right? You can see that clearly. So it's more about reading the markets and then having a strategy for, I have a hammer strategy, but it has to be when I believe the markets are ready for bounce or, you know, whatever, right? Yeah, you need a trend. Yep, exactly right. So whenever we have these runaway markets, the same thing happened to me today. I mean, not today, this year, right? We had just these crazy, normally you put three or four bull weeks in a row, you'll get a pullback. So sell against it. And then it just keeps rampaging without a pullback. So you get those and you probably ran into the same thing on the way down. You get two or three weeks down, it should bounce and it just keeps going. So you'll have that. That's why you always have a game plan in place of how can I make money with this? How can I avoid this? And how can I just lose small? Okay. The last little bit that I want to leave you with before I bounce out is remember your job is not to win and your job is not to lose. That's, that's not, that's not the case. Your job is to have an edge, have an edge in the markets, understand how the markets move, have an edge in the markets, and then put that edge on. If you lose, lose small. If the markets agree with you, let it win big. And most people can't do that. So I normally will be, my risk on credit spreads is about 30% of my max loss. So my plan allows me to set that risk in there. So that's what I use for my R for credit spreads is what I'm actually risking. R means risks, right? So what am I actually risking on these spreads? I'm risking 30% of my max loss per my strategy. So if you want to know more about my strategy, email me, Tony at reallifetrading.com. Uh, make sure I said that. There we go. Email me. You can get a hold of me that way. Um, you can check out our online courses. It's in there for credit spreads. Um, if you want to learn more about price action, there's courses and stuff in there as well. So just go to online courses and learn price action. Find the S curve. That's all that is. So you can do that. Um, we have a ton of stuff for free on YouTube. Search it. Start there. Um, but no matter what, you're going to have to put time in learning these markets, right? Put the time in learning these markets and accept the loss. Wow. Strong move up on SPY. There's the bounce we were looking for. How did it end up closing today? I got a bounce. I got some coaching to get to right now. Did we close up above that inside candle? Right at it. <laughs> so... Yeah, this thing is really trying to get going. Really trying to get going. We'll see what it does. Awesome. I think that's it. Dan, are you up next after me, brother? <laughs>